All right, I'd like to welcome you to the second session of this morning. And uh, the speaker is uh, Professor Ni Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. So, yeah, so I'm going to tell you um, today a little bit about some work that, um, that we're doing in our group uh, with Lionel Lacombe, who is here too, um, on, uh, on a, a sort of a new approach to trying to develop or put in memory into time-dependent DFT. And I'm particularly talking about the nonlinear response, uh, the nonlinear uh, uh, regime of TDDFT rather than linear response. Right? So I'm looking at real-time dynamics. I have in mind applications like you know, strong fields applied to your system or you know, starting in a non-stationary state, somehow preparing a state and letting it evolve in time. And um, actually, since I didn't really uh, talk too much about applications in my, in my uh, uh, pedagogical lectures, I thought I should really start off with showing you where uh, uh, a number of recent applications where TDDFT has been applied in this nonlinear regime. And in particular, what the first one here relates to um, Hardy's lecture on magnetism, where he showed us how to write down, how to treat uh, magnetic systems in, within a cone sham approach. Um, and here, uh, they actually did a calculation um, applying an ultrapass laser pulse, meaning a pulse which is about five femtoseconds or so, on a slab which is magnetized. And what you, what, if you measure the magnetization which is given in this figure here, you see that, okay, it starts to decrease during the duration of the pulse, but then most of the, it, 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 it demagnetizes very quickly after the pulse is applied, but it also happens on a very fast time scale, and it's within 20 femtoseconds. In fact, experimentally, this was observed back in the 90s, I guess, right? Um, but the sort of mechanism for the demagnetization was, was under a lot of debate. It wasn't really understood what it was. Was it the spin diffusion effect? Was it, you know, something like some some funny thing going thermal effect, what was it? But by doing this uh, TDDFT, so the first principles approach, including spin orbit coupling, which it, it turns out to be critical to include in this calculation, they could uh, understand this, why it happened so quickly. Uh, it's essentially an excitation mechanism followed by spin orbit coupling. Um, and, uh, and, and actually, they got reasonable time scales with, with the experiment. Um, so this was quite nice. Um, of another, of course, you can do atoms and molecules in intense fields as well. Um, also, another very topical application, photovoltaic design. Um, and this was it's this uh, carotenoid triad uh, molecule here, where uh, the authors ran an Ehrenfest TDDFT calculation. So they let the ions evolve. Um, classically with Ehrenfest uh, dynamics, a little bit like how Attila had mentioned uh, that he was doing for his uh, warm dense plasma um, regime. But, and then, um, and in fact, the result here was actually if you clamp the ions, uh, you get, no, there's a charge transfer to the C60. If you clamp the ions, you get almost no uh, charge transfer, right? N nothing at all when you get this gray line here. If you let the ions move, in particular, the ions in this tail here. So actually what happens is you initially photo excite on this ring here, and then the charge moves over to the buckyball. But in fact, the ionic dynamics on the tail is the thing that really drives the charge transport or is correlated with these oscillations in the charge as it transfers. In fact, again, they got quite reasonable agreement with the time scales that were observed in the experiment. It wasn't quite exact, especially because you might notice you never quite reach one charge, uh, one electron, you wouldn't get partial charge transfer in the calculation. But still, it's been useful and, and, and pretty good. So let's remind ourselves, and back to Hardy's lecture on TDDFT, how the, these, what, what actually these calculations were running. Right? So you run these time-dependent cone sham equations. And there's the cone sham potential. And as I mentioned in my talk, there's memory dependence here. But we really neglect it, and I uh, can go through this quite quickly because we did this in the lecture, right? So um, uh, you, use an, uh, you neglect to use an adiabatic approximation, sticking your time-dependent density into uh, a, a choice of ground state approximation, right? And you can then disentangle, as we said the, in the pedagogical lectures, the effect of the error due to the choice of the ground state approximation and the error from making the adiabatic approximation itself, right? And to do that, you can define adiabatically exact where you, in cases where you have it, you can evaluate the exact exchange correlation potential and uh, stick in the time instantaneous density there. 
Um, anyway, so the, but if we if we have a look at these approximations, and if we moreover look at model systems where we can actually solve the problem exactly, so that we can find the exact exchange correlation potential and compare with both adiabatically exact and other adiabatic approximations, we find that actually memory can be very important. In particular, and, and perhaps it is more important for the smaller systems, because for the larger systems you have vibronic coupling, you have many more complicated things that maybe wash out the memory, right, somewhat. But uh, still, we'd like to understand better the, sort of the errors and what's going on in these calculations. And in particular, in these smaller calculations where we do need to incorporate memory, um, I, we've been working on uh, a way uh, uh, to uh, a beginning, a starting point, and some initial investigations, initial approximations of incorporating memory in the practical functional. So that's what I'm going to tell you about. Right? So a quick outline here. So firstly, I actually, uh, you don't have to read all these bullet points, but the main point is that I'm going to first show you um, some example systems where we, I'll show you what I mean by these non-adiabatic effects and the implications of this in dynamics. And then in the second part, I will get to the more recent work we've been doing for um, uh, building approximations with memory uh, for these systems. Okay, so the first case I'd like to show you is charge transfer dynamics out of the ground state. So this is a calculation done in Matthias Nest's group. And they took a lithium cyanide molecule here. Um, and they drove it on resonance with a weak field so that um, you drive one electron uh, from a sort of in this bonding region over over here, over to this uh, lithium atom here. Right? And if you do this calculation using like a time-dependent CI singles or CI singles doubles, you get a large change in the dipole moment, as indicated by these red and green lines. If you now try this with hartree fock or LDA or PBE or any functional, you begin to get some charge transfer, but ultimately it collapses and it oscillates. You don't get much at all. It's a very poor calculation. So we thought, okay, well, let's try to reduce this to something we could understand. We first looked at a real space molecule, right, so uh, in one dimension, two electrons, where we modeled the electron transfer. Um, but actually, we even went more simply than that because we wanted to run it with the adiabatically exact approximation. And um, this is a hybrid molecule. So if you like, uh, uh, if you, you we pick, take two sites, we put a bias across the molecule so that um, one, it, one site is higher than the other, and in the ground state, we have two electrons sitting here on the right atom here. We, again, apply a weak field, which is resonant with the charge transfer excitation, where one electron has moved over here. And if we look at the exact dipole, we get kind of a Rabi oscillation there, and this is the exact dipole. Now notice that the frequencies, if, oh, sorry, before I get to the frequencies, okay, so now I ran adiabatically exact, and I get something not, not unlike what I see here, just kind of oscillations. It starts to do something and then ultimately collapses. In fact, in, a, in our real space model molecule of two electrons, we say something very, very similar. I don't have the graph here, but it's very similar for exact exchange for self-interaction corrected LDA. Again, it begins to do something and ultimately fails. Now, in this calculation, because of the very small Hilbert space, we can easily find the exact ground state functional and propagate with it. And this defines then our adiabatically exact so this is propagation of the adiabatically exact functional, and you can see it gets a bit further, but again, ultimately fails. We might wonder, oh, is this because the chart, as Leor said yesterday, most of the functionals really give very bad charge transfer excitation energies, and he has a beautiful correction of, with this range separation way of getting consistent charge transfer excitation energies. In fact, if I look at the charge transfer excitation energy with the adiabatically exact functional, I get a very good energy. Right? Pretty, very good up to the you know, 0.5177 for the exact, 0.5187 for the adiabatic exact. Despite having extremely good charge transfer excitation energies, the dynamics is very poor. Charge transfer dynamics is much harder than just getting the excitations right. So, um, so then we thought, well, actually, we shouldn't really be surprised. Because if we think about what the cone sham system is doing, you're starting with one orbital, W occupied, right, because it's a single slated determinant with two electrons in it. And you're driving one electron over to the other system. But throughout the dynamics, we have just one orbital that becomes extremely delocalized. It's like a time-dependent de time, uh, time delocalization error in some sense, right? So this, this thing, this orbital becomes extremely delocalized. Now, in the exact problem, 
you actually, if we look at the exact wave function, we don't have one orbital. We have like a Heitler-London form. We have a one up and one down here, and a one up and one down there. So it's like a double state, a determinant state. So, but we can never reach that, even in the exact conchem, because you're stuck with your one orbital that has to describe both the electron that just stays sitting and the electron that transfers. And we can do it in exact TDDFT, but it's very difficult. How does exact TDDFT do it, right? So, charge transfer out of the ground state is hard because a single conchem orbital must describe both the transferring electron and the one that stays. How does the exact potential do it? In fact, Let's have a look at the exact conchem potential for the problem. Here's the initial density. Here's the final density. This is, the exter this is now my 1D molecule, right? so in between the Hubbard and the real and the true molecule. Right? That, uh, I've made another model system. This is our external potential. The red here is the conchem potential. The blue here is the correlation potential, pretty benign initially. But in the final state, in fact, it develops a step feature and, and a peak. And in fact, if you look at the step, feature, this delta, you can see it's equal to, and we can prove this, and if you want to see the details, it's in this paper, asymptotically in the, in the limit of very large separation, the um, step and the exact potential has this size. The difference in the ionization energies of the ND minus one electron donor, right, the cation, oh, the anion, no, sorry, I get confused with it, the cation, and the, uh, and the acceptor anion, Na plus one, right? Okay, but if you look at the step in the adiabatically exact correlation potential, we actually get the derivative discontinuity, but of the uh, donor um, cation, right, of the donor ND minus one system. And it's the derivative discontinuity of this. It's a little, it's a little bizarre why this comes out. It actually comes out of the, uh, we can prove it, but I, I think the deeper implications are yet to be really understood in these formulas, right? But, okay, so we get, we get, we get these. And, and um, yeah, we, you can see that we don't quite, uh, we don't quite punch to get the full step, right? But anyway, we might say, well, this is a bit silly. Why are we trying to do this problem? It's very difficult. And moreover, for example, in, in the calculation that, we, that I showed you with the, photo, with the charge transfer and the photovoltaic candidate, you actually excite first. You photo excite first. So let's try to get that first. Let's try and get that dynamics. So we instead said, okay, let's photo excite first so that we now have two orbitals. Now I can drive one orbital and let the other one sit there and they're not tied together. Right? And so, well, surely we can do this in TDDFT with the ni nice simple functionals. The black here is the dipole. The red is exact exchange. And we were very happy to get this result. We said, okay, this is why the Carlo Razzi's work on the triad work. We understand now. But then we said, well, we should, let's see, LDA, let's look at self interaction corrected LDA, let's see what happens. And again, we get this turning around, this failure. This is self-interaction corrected LDA. In fact, interestingly, these oscillations are well captured, but ultimately it collapses LDA even worse. Why was this? So in understanding why this is the case, we realize that in fact we're driving a resonant, we're driving the dynamics resonantly, right? Which is very different than what Carlo was doing in this calculation. I'll come back to that okay, perhaps. But okay, so but we're driving it resonantly. But if we think about the cone champ potential as the charge is transferring. The cone champ potential, because it's density dependent, the cone champ potential itself changes a lot because it's a function of this density. Okay, then, so therefore, if I ask, okay, what are the excitations coming out of the cone champ potential? Obviously, they will change a lot, which means we're, we're sort of driving ourselves out of resonance. But then yet we think, well, no, because the exact TDDFT system does this. So how does that work? Well, it's because in exact TDDFT, you have not just the bare excitations of the exchange correlation potential, but you have the FXC correction too. We have this dynamical correction that you might remember from the linear response uh, lecture. Both of these together are important to get our exact TDDFT energy. And if we look at this and for the exact functional and the functional of time, the time dependence and the bare conchem frequency exactly cancel the time dependence or I should say the other way around, the time dependence in the FXC correction exactly calculates, the time, uh, uh, cancels out the time dependent in the exact, uh, in the bare conchem frequency, if you had the exact function. This is very difficult for approximations to do, and this is why you, uh, we, these, these ones failed, interestingly enough, exact exchange worked, and I can show you afterwards if you're interested why this happens. For exact exchange, why this satisfies this, I would call it a new exact condition. 
um, this constant resonance conditional. Um, okay, this I will um, just go quickly. This has uh, implications for real molecules, and this kind of peak shifting has been observed when people have been trying to model pump probe experiments, for example, um, or transient uh, spectroscopy type experiments. So, so it's, uh, it has got very uh, it has physical impact on the on the calculation. Okay. So, so then you might think, okay, well, then, then any time we're trying to do driven dynamics, it's going to be a problem, right? So let's forget driven dynamics and let's look at non-resonant driving. And so we just apply, and again, it's a, now we have two soft Coulomb interacting 1D helium atom, right? And we're just going to apply a non-resonant field at the 0.4 to the exact frequency is 0.533 or something like this. And it's pretty similar in all these populations, um, 0.549, I think, in LDA. Okay, if you look at the dipole moment, the black is the exact here, and the purple here is the exact exchange, and it works, and, and green is LDA. You can see they do okay for the first cycle or two, but then they just you know, look a little bit like spoonie spaghetti, right? So it's just, it doesn't work so well out there. In fact, we can sh have a look at the movie of what's happening here. So um, here, if, uh, if we have a look, I just plotted for clarity just the exact Density on top of, and the purple is the exact exchange density, and you can see it oscillating back and forth. And in the exact potential, you see these step and peak features and a falling away of the, poten of the density, uh, of the potential under the curve. And so you can see it, it is developing these funny features I'm going to come back to. In fact, these step and peak features, um, which are not captured in the approximations, in any of the approximations, um, really generically appear. Um, and there's been, I'll give you a bunch of references if you're interested. There's a bunch uh, of papers which are show that any type of non-perturbative dynamics has these dynamical steps. Uh, I, I, um, they're completely missed by any adiabatic approximation. They appear even if, if, if there's no field. For example, here's a calculation we um, we done originally. This is simply no field, right? We just begin in a 50-50 superposition and then quantum mechanically you expect just the oscillating between the two states and the dipole moment oscillates like this regularly, like the black. Exact exchange shows this purple thing, right? So oscillations with also some other superimposed dynamics. And again, here are the potentials and you see this step kind of going side by side, side to side as the density is evolving. So this calculation we actually first did um, with Peter Elliott, who is a postdoc in my group and now he's a working with uh, 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 Hardy. But when he first saw these calculations and he first looked at these steps and he said, this really reminds me of the Norwegian curling team. I said, what? Oh, let me come back to this. Let me show you the Norwegian curling team. So this uh, they apparently, and I, don't know, I really don't know why they did this, but for some reason they, were, they put their pants on without using their hands. Let me show you the picture. And, I, and he showed me the picture and I said, oh, that's really funny. <laughs> so here is the exact correlation potential, and they somehow know about this exact, this is maybe an adiabatic approximation. <laughs> okay, anyway, so, so this was something Peter uh, came up with. <laughs> so anyway, so um, here, so, so in fact, I haven't said why the adiabatically exact, I haven't showed you that the adiabatically exact calculation misses these large features. Here I plot it. So here's the red is the exact, and the blue is the adiabatically exact, and you can see that it looks completely different. Right? So it, it misses these step features. We can, uh, in, 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 in this particular calculation and some of the other ones, I can sh we can prove that the exact uh, these steps are due to local acceleration in the system, an integral of this. Right? And so if you're looking just at the density, you're going to miss the local acceleration because it's like n double dot. Well, not really. It's a bit more subtle than that, but anyway, it's it, it's not contained in the instantaneous density. Okay, so here we go. Um, okay, so so anyway, the point is it's it's non-local in space, non-local in time. It appears generically, and uh, this Ramsden and Godby have um, some great papers on this too, uh, uh, where they're looking at quasi-particle propagation, the 20 electrons, and they also see these step features, right? And you know um, that we saw some you know beautiful developments in ground state DFT using. So the MELS uh, exact conditions in mind and, and jump produce the function, new functionals, but unfortunately those, those functionals will likely not help you. They don't have the right and neither will range separated hybrids in the present form. Um, because um, even though they, especially meta-GJs, do have some orbital dependence, which do have some 
Uh, memory dependence, I, I believe that probably it's not the right type to get these steps, although this is something we could look at in a bit more detail. I, I don't have a reason to think that they should be, right? Maybe I'm wrong, maybe it will, and that would be really nice, right? <laughs> so we, maybe it's something we should look at, okay. So um, before I get to how we are trying to build in memory dependence, I want to point out something else. Um, and this is this initial state dependence that I had mentioned in my pedagogical lecture. Remember we said that, well, actually we can choose any phi naught that we want, right? Now, when we begin in the ground state, it's natural to choose the ground state one. So let's, let's not think about that. Let's think about the case which I just showed you, the 50-50 superposition state. Um, usually, when you're running your cone sham, you choose a single Slater determinant. But actually, as I said in the Pagiology lecture, you can choose any wave function with the same initial density and time derivative of the density at the initial time. Right? And so if you have an interacting state, which is the 50-50 superposition, well, in principle, you could choose anything, but you could choose, in particular, a cone-sham slate uh, cone sham wave function, which is also a superposition, perhaps weighted by A. So, for example, if it was A equals zero, it's simply, simply the usual slate determinant case, right? single slate determinant case. For A equals one, um, okay, it's in green here. Then, uh, if I take like a non-interacting state of of some potential in the first excited state and make it so that it has the right density in the first time derivative. Um, then, um, then this is a configuration similar to the true. You could leave a bit, it's not unique. In fact, you can find another one like this, and we found one. You can even take the correlated many body state. And if you look at the exact cone sham potentials, oh yeah, sorry, just a technical point which I'm not really tell, saying anything about. In order to find these potentials, the exact exchange correlation potentials, it's a little tricky. You have to numerically you have to use a fixed point iteration method that um, Mikhail Rugenthaler, Robert Van Leuven, Marcus Pence, and Sarah Nielsen have, um, have a really nice uh, method, uh, but numerically a bit fiddly, but uh, Lionel has managed to actually implement it in a, in a relatively straightforward code. Um, but you can uh, do it that you can, um, you can actually find these potentials for arbitrary initial state forms. Anyway, the point is, uh, this has got way too many curves on it. I just want you to focus on the red, the green, and the black. The black here, I don't mean this black, this is the black of the density, right, the one that goes up. But let's look at the black, which is the black, which is this one here, the, the well structure. This is the adiabatically exact. Okay. The red is what I showed you just before in the movies, right, the, the exchange correlation potential for um, a state, a determinant state. And the green here is choosing now the configuration similar. And you can see that these effects are much smaller, right, except then at the later time again, we get the steps again. It's not, in fact, periodic. So you can see we can, we can maybe, if you're interested in short time dynamics, we can play with initial state dependence. But again, ultimately, at longer times, we need something more, right? Okay. So what are we trying? Oh, so, uh, yeah, just if you want to, uh, this perspective I wrote last year, we summarize some of these problems. If you want a bit more detail, also I have, it has a more detailed reference than I have given here. Okay, so we'll just to summarize steps and peaks, we need non-adiabatic density dependence. Uh, we need non-adiabatic density dependence also for the peak shifting problem. Uh, sometimes you can judiciously choose your initial state and to help uh, and to be closer to the adiabatic approximation for the exact potential, but at longer times it's unclear about how effective that is. Right? Okay, so what are we doing to try to break free of the adiabatic approximation? In fact, um, there's an exact expression for the time-dependent exchange correlation potential. And uh, this can be derived by look, looking at the second derivative of density of the interacting system and the second derivative of density of the cone sham system, putting them equal to each other. And then you use the kind of various equation motion. And it's first, actually, I, I should have had the Van Leuven reference, but he first did this in 99. And the references are in this paper, too. But um, you get this expression here. In the top here, you identify uh, Kieran's density matrix that he had uh, introduced in this pedagogical lecture. This is the one body reduced density matrix of the interacting system. An arrow is missing here. This is that for the cone sham system. So this first term is kind of like a kinetic term. Right? It depends on the difference between the kinetic correlation term. It depends on the difference between the interacting and cone sham density matrices. The second term here has the interaction in there. And it depends on the exchange correlation hole that you might remember from several lectures earlier this week, but this time it's time dependent. 
and this we call the interaction component. Okay, now, of course, we don't have this in, the, in our Kumchan calculation, because it's a property of the exact wave function, exact system. Likewise, we don't have this. So these terms we need to approximate. Well, what can we do? So, oops, oh, sorry, yeah, before I tell you how what we do, let me just, I should quickly, for the 50-50 superposition state I showed you, in fact, you can see, partly because of this nice integral here, this one is relatively smooth and well-like, the, the VXC, X and VXCW, the uh, interaction components, whereas the set features are largely appearing in the kinetic term here, right? Okay. So, what do we do to approximate? Well, the first thing you could say, well, let's, uh, since this, especially because this is integrated over, perhaps we just could replace this with the cone sham exchange correlation hall. And if you do this, what happens? Well, firstly, you get an orbital functional. For, and secondly, if your cone sham state is a single state determinant, this is simply time-dependent exact exchange. But I would say it's a much easier way to get time-dependent exact exchange than time-dependent OEP. For example, you, you simply have to solve a sturm liouville type equation for which a solution is, is unique, in fact. Right? So, it's, so perhaps this is a nice way even to, to get time-dependent exact exchange. When the cone sham system is not an initial state determinant, then it includes also correlation. It has time non-locality as well as spatial non-locality and includes a degree of initial state dependence. Okay, so, the, so this, as I'm going to show you, actually is a pretty good approximation. However, what do we do here? And here it's not so simple. If I try to do something similar like replace everything with a cone sham counterpart, I get zero, right? So we don't want to do that, right? So actually, so far, we've just done a couple of naive things, right? Firstly, what we did was we said, let's freeze the difference between the two density matrices. Now, we put it, whatever it is initially. There's some, still some time dependence that's going to appear in the potential because of this density factor here. Another thing we could do is say, well, let's freeze. Look, we do have access to this because as the system is time evolving, we get the cone sham orbitals, we can form this. Right? But so, so another thing we could do is this, just freeze this component, because that's the thing we don't have access to, and keep the time-dependent cone sham fixed matrix, right? And then we'll have the time dependence from this as well as from the prefecture density. Or we could just freeze the whole thing, right? Oh, that's uh, five minutes? Okay, it's fine. Um, oh, no, three minutes. Perfect. Okay. And then I have five dot 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 here, which Lionel will be filling in in the next little bit. He has some uh, very interesting ideas on bootstrapping density matrix function. To, to do this, right? But we don't have, I don't have results yet to show you. Um, but let's first consider the performance, their satisfaction of some exact conditions, right? So these are some of the exact conditions that we discussed a little bit for, that are relevant to the time-dependent case. And, and here this shows which one is satisfying what. And in particular, uh, okay, uh, you know, which ones are important? Well, especially for the small one and two electron systems, we think self-interaction correction is important. So we want to pick, we don't want to pick, for example, frozen row one, right, because that violates this, right? Zero force theorem is, is satisfied by everything except for if when we freeze everything, for the whole, the whole VCT, right? So in particular, the results I'm going to show you are for these two here, the VXCS, right, where we replace the exchange correlation hall of the time dependent system with the exchange correlation hall of the cone sham system and completely neglect the, the VCT term, the kinetic term. And here is where we freeze the, the, the density matrix difference in the kinetic term and add that also to the XC. Yes. So I'm going to show you some examples here, right? So let me, I just have a couple slides, right? So this is now back to this arbitrary laser, this one that we ran, this was the dynamics I showed you before. Sorry, this is the exact exchange where I showed you that goes well for a cycle and a half or so and then goes crazy. This purple here is this um, VX, this is now we're adding this delta rho calculation. And you can see that it's uh, that's much better for longer time. We can have a look at the movie to just check the densities, not just the dipole moments, as we heard in the last lecture. That might be important, right? So, in fact, again, what is interesting that the purple calculation. So, so in this case, the VXCS is equivalent to exact exchange. We said in the ground state. But it's interesting that the purple calculation. Yeah, I mean, you you we will occasionally see these step features, right? It doesn't look that. Yeah, here for example, right? They, it's not quite the same, but they have. And visibility. And they don't look so bad, right? So I'm not, one question is what is the importance of these on the dynamics? Uh, 
this is something we need to understand better. There's obviously other differences too, right? Like this lowering, gradual lowering. In some sense, it's related to the development of the step, right? Because it's lowering before the step kicks in. So it's not, uh, but you know, okay. And so we can sit and be mesmerized a little bit by those movies. But uh, then we move on to the other example. This is a field free superposition, and our spaghetti is back. But here, the black is this exact dipole moment just going back and forth. And if we look at the green, which is the exact, which is now we're choosing VXES, but we're choosing initial state, which is up and down. So it's no longer exact exchange, right? It's got correlation because our initial cone chain state is not a state of determinant. And you can see that you get uh, better than before, right? And um, the purple is now when we add the, our kinetic correlation, right? But, and so, and it's a bit tricky to tell what's what, but if you look at the frequencies, it looks like adding this kinetic correlation part is important. So I'll skip the movie in here and go on to my summary. Just maybe I don't know if you need to summarize uh, what we're working on now. In particular, Lionel has, is, has this uh, great idea of trying to bootstrap density matrix functional theory into density functional theory, and um, uh, we should have some results on that soon. I want to thank, I've been very lucky to have some excellent postdocs um, in the group, um, in particular Lionel, also Joanna Fuchs, uh, a wonderful postdoc who's now about to take a position in Buenos Aires and her dear little baby who helped us with our calculations. Maya Lu and uh, Graham who's been working on exact factorization. Um, and Sir Nielsen, of course, who is the one who, co who initially showed us how to code his global fixed point iteration. Thank you to Attila and Kieran and Hardy and all of you for your attention. It was, yes. And how does it work? I mean, I yeah. don't know how to infer it in terms of... In terms of like femtoseconds or something like yeah. that. It's like 43.4 um, uh, is the conversion okay. <laughs> factor into femtoseconds. Yeah, but um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, I, uh, my problem is I think only in atomic units. <laughs> yeah, but yes. Yeah. And what's the maximum time that you can see in the simulation of this structure? Oh, well, so these are very simple systems. So we can we can actually go for a very long time with these calculations. It's not this is not a problem. Yeah, and even the approximations. Although actually, interestingly, uh, one of the approximations which has the memory that I, we were trying to explore, which violated the zero force theorem, we see quite rapidly this and the numerical instability that that occurs because of self excitation coming in. And so this is one of the ones we will not be pursuing. Right. So yeah. Um, relaxation, so the propagation in imaginary time is in a number of wave function propagation method, a common method to get the eigenstates of the yeah. system. Um, can you also do that in UK? And if so, how is the uh, dependence on the on your choice of the initial state? Uh, yes, that's an extremely interesting question. Yes, yeah, so you're saying that in fact can we, in fact, use the time-dependent case in imaginary time to go back to get ground states or and, excited states? And how does it compare to the response? Yes, uh, great question. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's something we should look at. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, whenever, I mean, you've been studying these steps a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Do they, they, they usually occur where density is, is very low? Yes. Is that always true? Yeah. Or? Right. So, so when, so we've seen that in the cases where the density is extremely low, then yes, they could, they typically appear and they have no impact on the dynamics, really. But the thing is, they do also appear in tails of the density where sometimes, where and, and and when it's appearing in the in the regions of the density where it's not so low but it's still small, the step tends to be more gradual. Like it has a width. It's not usually so sharp. Right. It's not so much step-like. It's more like a gentle slope. And so there, I, there the, there the uh, physics is important. There the impact of the, the on the dynamics is much more important because you get this electric field. Of course, otherwise you don't get the force. If, you, if it's really a step, you don't get the force. Who cares, right? But if, if you get something more gentle, then it's telling you there's an effect on your dynamics. And then propagate. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in fact, the the place. So if um, Lionel also has looked at scattering problems. 
in this way, and and the various choices of different initial states with Yasumi Suzuki as well. And and in fact, you find that the steps initially you get very large steps, but they don't affect your dynamics at all. Then as you come in, the steps get more gentle, they get smaller in magnitude, and then a little later you can see the dynamics change. Uh, if you don't have those features, the dynamics uh, is very different if you, uh, than, than the exact and the approximate calculations is missing these features. I have two questions. Yes. One is, the, can you convert this memory uh, into frequency? So that you can do it, you will use it in a linear response calculation. Yes, it's a good question. So um, I don't know yet. Um, I think in principle uh, we should be able to. The thing is that, um, yeah. So for so uh, yeah, I guess in principle we should, right? Because we should, we can, we would need to know like functional derivatives of these things, or if we freeze them. I mean, the thing is, with these approximations, perhaps it's not. Uh, the best thing to do. But, but you can take it, say, for if you know this, take some model system, you know all the pieces yes. more accurately. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would be really interesting to see what the kernel... What the kernel will be looked like. Yeah, ex yes, exactly. But the kernel has to be the density functional derivative of these things. So we need to know. We, I mean, it's not just the... We, sure. Just from one model system with others, we have sure. to be a little thoughtful about how sure. to do that. Sure. Yeah. And maybe well, it's possible. Yeah. My second question is, that I actually, I really enjoy your dynamic analysis about what went wrong with the adiabatic approximations. Mm -hmm. But it, it really, um, I got disturbed thinking about other paper I read yes. using TDDMT to simulate nanoparticle yes, photo excitation dynamics. Yeah. It was all like LDA or yes. GGA or even hybrid. Yeah. All of the exactly. thing yeah. that uh, could go wrong, yeah. but yet, uh, Fabulous result was recorded yes. in wonderful so, journals. Yeah, I know. So, so I know. My, my, my question is, that can I believe those results? Right. So, so I would, I would say there's two things. Okay. No, so this is also something that we want to look at. The mm -hmm. cases we're looking at are really worst case. Yeah. Two electrons, right? Okay. So we don't have the buffering, if you like, of other electrons. We don't have nuclei dynamics, right? Mm -hmm. Which can also, like, especially with the resonance problem, right? The nuclear dynamics can really smear out. The resonance, so it doesn't matter if you're shifting, right? Mm -hmm. So, 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 so I think a lot of that is happening. But also, I think we should bear in mind that people publish the results that work. And I've talked to some of the authors, and they said, "Oh, well, this is one system that actually worked." And they don't say that in the paper. <laughs> but you know, like you know, so, so people publish the results that actually that work, right? Oh, but, so they, they so, filter so, out the yeah. The, the I mean, and I, I don't want to put that down. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe it's also true that there. I mean, I think I am looking at worst case. It's a combination of these two. Mm -hmm. I think it's a combination of the fact that, that actually as we add more electrons, as we add nuclear dynamics, we have temperature, whatever, these, these effects are going to smear out, right, and maybe not so important. Uh, I think memory will, know. Yeah, know. yeah, memory has a finite effect, but yeah, but, but I would like to understand better. Is it that or is it something in the functional? This is why. So one thing we really need to do is build up the size of the system that we're looking at. I mean, we really need, if we want to do this kind of thing, there are ways to, like, you know, do a CI type thing uh, for n electrons, or right, 10 electrons, and to see the scale of these features. You know, well, this is one thing we have to do. Because otherwise, I, I, everything might be nice, but completely useless. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, a comment about this last comment. Okay. Um, one thing that is important to remember is that density functional theory in general, both ground state and, and time dependent, is um, probably will never be a high accuracy theory. It lies in the nature of things. So accuracy is okay, is decent, you get a decent answer for many questions, but it's never super sharp, exactly. Now, if you ask questions, I want to describe processes where it is essential that you hit exactly the resonance, then it's not a good idea to do the BFT. And because you will miss it. If you're interested, what is the rough picture of the spectrum, of the optical spectrum of a huge molecule, you get all kinds of peaks, and some are bigger, and some are small, you will get a decent answer. But if you want to do Barbie oscillations or things that, that live on the fact that you're precisely on the resonance, sure. then, then you have a problem. 
So the question yeah. So it's, it depends a bit on what you want to do with things. Exactly. And people say you cannot even describe the obvious. What is this? Uh, what theory is this? So I mean, it's also always has to keep in mind that what one wants to do. With it. This is true, uh, and I, I completely agree with you. I, I think that it is, however, important that the, that to understand where in the larger system yes, the no, errors are coming in. Absolutely. And yeah, I agree with you about the yeah, that you're exactly talking. about this point. In fact, the, the, the paper that you were quoting on the triad molecule mm -hmm. that contained a prediction, proper prediction uh, coming from DDD and D, mm -hmm. that there was a charge oscillation on a longer time scale about uh, uh, 70 or 80 femtoseconds, and this was afterwards confirmed by the experiment. So, I mean, there, there is a lot correct. Sharp, I wouldn't go for that. Um, I have another uh, a question, in fact. So you touched it a bit with um, um, what, what generalized Kohn-Sham in the TV frame would do. Mm -hmm. So there's, um, there's, there's, there's an important thing to realize that you mentioned on the side that if you have an adiabatic functional, think of time dependent Hans Flock, um, but an orbital, uh, the word adiabatic refers to the orbital. Yes, yeah. yeah. This, in the strict TDDFT sense, can mean that it has a memory. Yes. yes no. Yeah. And uh, it would be very interesting to find out whether these uh, uh, these effects that you showed can be captured by a adiabatic with respect to the orbitals, sure. like typical hybrids are, uh, can be described if you yes. use the time frame graph. So if we so so firstly when you're doing an orbital functional you there's two choices as as Leo said like there's the OEP and then there's or or maybe like I said too there's or the generalized function and they too will give you very different effects. Yes. For example, if you do the, if you do these calculations with OEP with any hybrid, you will not get these effects, right? And that can be shown because it's it's mixing in this exact exchange which for these with the problems I've shown you will does not have the right uh, structure to get these dynamical features. So I can I can show you. Because you know that. Because I know that, the, for example, if I do exact exchange or self interaction corrected LDA, so I can show you from the formulas, because you, put, uh, especially for two electrons, right, for two electrons, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that says it. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, with this resonance condition, um, and on that, on, on that subject, I just want to mention, I totally disagree with Art. Uh, <laughs> uh, just in principle. But, uh, <laughs> uh, so, you were showing that the idiomatically exact calculations don't, don't, don't get it. Right? <clears throat> Have you thought about just looking backwards in time? Shifting, mm -hmm. so the adiabatically exact is instantaneous. Mm -hmm. So looking uh, at the function now, in principle, it depends on you know it's a function of, of the whole history. Mm -hmm. But just looking at instants in time, single instants in time, yeah. it's a way I see. Okay. To see if potentials adiabatically. Depend on the I see. Look like hmm. the proper ones. I see. That's very interesting. I think um, we should look into a bit more detail. I know that uh, the step features will not be there because the adiabatic ones never get these steps. But uh, aside from the step feature, perhaps. Well, when you say they never get these steps, yeah, they don't I, have any steps at all. Yeah, for 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 the for at least for the densities, apart from the charge transfer step, let's put that one aside, right? Because that's okay. yeah, but if okay. I'm looking at the dynamic one within a contained within the region, not not sort of charge transfer, because that's where the delocalization comes in there. As well. But if I just don't worry about delocalization, just think about dynamic step, then uh, yeah, we won't. Those won't get the step. I, again, I I am not wedded to to getting the step. Right, I mean, I think that some of the step features are very important, but 
Not well, wrong. Well, the important thing is getting the lessons. Yeah, yeah. yeah, right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, uh, we, we should take a look at it. That would be a nice fix. I mean, it's it especially important to see things that's not possible. Awesome. <laughs> All right, let's uh, thank our speaker again. Thank you.